And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. He is the head of Eternum Gaming, creators of the Eterni Eternity RPG, the one and only Jake Tegman. I'm hoping I got that last name right. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually impressed. Most people don't get that pronounced right. I, Thanks uh, for having me on, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> I have experience when it comes to when it comes to pronouncing names, and <laughs> believe me when I when I say after you've tried to pronounce some Polish or or um or Turkish or even Estonian names. Yeah, um, no kidding. Amer American names are um easy mode comparatively speaking. <laughs> But yeah, with but even so, even so, um, it's a bit of a tradition to open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Sure. So, what was your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it um, stick? Um, <laughs> so, ever since I was a kid, like five, six years old, I've kind of just made my own games to entertain mm -hmm. myself, and. Did you ever watch Dexter's Lab? Yes. So there was an episode on Dexter's Lab when I was like six or seven years old where he was essentially playing Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And once I saw that, I just decided it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And so I went down to my room. I was in, living in the basement. Mm -hmm. And I got out a huge um, <laughs> like sheet of construction paper and just started drawing a map. And I put a little town on there and like a cave that you would go to to fight stuff. And then um, just started trying to imagine what I would need for a game like that. Because I had never played D&D, &D, but I wanted to create something that was like it so that I could kind of play D&D. &D. Um, and so that was really the start of it all. And over time just shared that game with friends made adjustments finally when i was like in junior high i got a couple dnd &D books and mm -hmm. played a really short campaign with friends and tried out a bunch of different systems through high school and college and um yeah i just basically have been addicted to the concept of it ever since <laughs> that dexter's lab episode yeah um funny thing about that particular episode is i've um I've used I've used that episode with my with my class to so you, okay so you know that one yeah D um D and D D to yeah <laughs> to um go to go into what not what not to do as right. a GM because like immediately kill everybody and reroll dice for um, their detriment <laughs> both well both Dexter and D and D D in that in that episode. Um, are two, are examples of two types of DMs that you should not want to be. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a funny episode. Yeah, D um, Dexter obviously is the that guy DM who the adversarial one who is tr who will fudge right. the dice just to make everyone suffer. And don't give don't get it wrong. As GMs, we all have a bit of a masochist <laughs> streak in in us. It has its place. Yeah, for sure. A a sadomasochistic streak in 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 all of us. Um, <laughs> but on the other end is Dee Dee's approach, which is the Monty Hall approach, as it, as it's known. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm actually I'm not super familiar with what you mean by that. Um. Now the Monty Hall approach is. And obviously, this is a pun since it's spelled H A U L instead of H A L L. It's a uh -huh. play off of Monty Hall, the the um, original host of Let's Make a Deal. Okay, and gotcha. it's when a GM is a little bit too um too too in, too um too rewarding when it comes to loot ex experience and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, both of both of them are two are two extremes of the same pendulum. One of them is too, if you're if you're too 
I like to ascribe it to um, the concept of flow theory, where uh-huh. if you if you try and if you try and go too hard too quickly, you'll um, frustrate people. If you go too easy too quickly, you'll bore them. Sure, I would agree with that. But when it came to it, when it came to eternity, um, how did that really get started? Was that ju- was that just based off of the diff- the different house rules and the like that you had done with other systems that kind of went into its own thing, or did or did it have a different journey? I I on it. I mean, it, basically, it just took a lot of inspiration from other games that I liked, mm-hmm. and everything was really custom. So the first version of Eternity, I guess, I made when I was sometime in high school before I had played a lot of D&D. Mm-hmm. And what I was playing a lot of that time was the Final Fantasy video game series. And so sort of the feel of combat and the feel of the storytelling is is really where that came from. And then I basically just wanted to make a game that I wanted to play, which I'm sure is how a lot of people mm-hmm. who create games go about it. And there was just some parts about D and D, such as the combat. We were talking, you and I, just a little bit earlier about fighters and how they don't necessarily feel in some versions of D and D that they have their own distinct combat system. They're just kind of what any class can be, mm-hmm. to a degree, just better. And so I really tried to create characters that people could play that are very dynamic and unique and. Um, yeah, it was just a, a lot of versions of putting together some concepts and some numbers and some storylines and then playing with friends. And through that sort of play testing, we would, I mean, we would play test entire campaigns. Eventually it just really transformed into its own game system that I, I felt like was ready to, um, be, I guess, given out to the public. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. I d- I remember get. I remember looking into it and definitely getting a um, Final Fantasy vibe from from the way it was described, as as well as as well as the list of um, cl- of classes. Definitely not feeling like the the tradi- the traditional sort of classes you would see in a fa- you would see in a fantasy game. Sure. Um. Some of them, some of them, I've, some of them I've definitely seen in 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 other instances, but a lot, but a uh-huh. lot of them were were spun were spun in their own way. Um. Mm-hmm. And when it came to when it came to uh, re- when it came to class design, um, was was it a case where you um where you just ha- where you just had a um, brainstorm about a bunch of different classes or did um did the job system in the various final fantasy games provide a bit of a format for you for sure um yeah the the classes i guess what i should say first is that really the first version of eternity is probably like close to 15 years old at this Mm -hmm. point so um it's only been published for like two or three years now but <clears throat> the, I mean, the classes went through a lot of iterations, and certainly I took a lot of inspiration from other games, Final Fantasy. And like you said, there are classes that people can find in other games, like Legionnaire, mm-hmm. I think is a pretty straightforward commander-type class. Um, Assassin, you know, Thief. There's classes that I think are just inherent to the fantasy genre that I wanted to make sure we're included in the game just in a unique way. And then there was classes like Cryomancer, which I think is less common, Vampire Mage, um, Nether Knight. There's really quite a few that are are more, I guess, uh, unique Mm -hmm. to the world of Eternity. Yeah. Any? Now... Yeah. One of the th- one of the things that the game talks about on on your site is sure. the is the idea of of a uh, multiple game masters. Um, yeah. <laughs> now when it now 
even though it's uncommon, even even in the even in the depths that I that I wander through all the time, sure. the idea of multiple GMs is cer is certainly a no is certainly a novel idea. Was and sure the same th and the same thing applies doubly so for games that are GM list. I mean, they exist, but they're not. Uh -huh. But I wouldn't exactly say say that you're going to see a whole lot of them. No. No, um, definitely not. What prompted um, your approach when it comes to this whole <laughs> shared GM approach? Yeah, that is honestly a great question because it's it is probably the single biggest thing that separates Eternity from other games. Um, although there's a number of you know distinct flavors that Eternity brings, but basically my role play experience personally is that I have always been a GM because I just love creating worlds and I love telling stories. And of course I just love the power of it. It's fun, <laughs> you know, but I found after DMing multiple, very long campaigns that I just, I would pour what felt like my heart and soul into every gaming session. And so honestly, by the end of a gaming session, I would be tired and I wanted to keep, playing games but i i just got to a point where i didn't want to prepare as much as i used to for dms because i i you know have more stuff going on in life now and less ability to just like focus on that is one of my main things in life all the time and i also really wanted to play characters because i hadn't gotten very much opportunities and i also realized that I had some really creative people in my gaming group. So <clears throat> we basically just started playing around with the idea of multiple GMs. And it's really, it's a concept that is really easy to mess up, which is probably why a lot of games don't do that. That's why it's so rare to find games. I think that are GM lists or multiple GMs. And so the first like 15 pages of the eternity rule book are basically about the steps required to create a shared world mm -hmm. that everyone draws from and everyone is continually creating in lockstep because the number one thing that can derail a multiple GM game is confusion and chaos, people having different ideas about what should happen to different things. And so um, what we found is, you know, we've really refined this process is that People love it, and I think what they love about it is not only that they get to help create the world, but you also get to play a character at the same time, and um, <clears throat> you just you get a, a lot more play time. So normally, like when I would DM and there would be players, you know, I would set up a situation and then we would kind of go around the table. People would say what they want to do, and that means I might interact with one person or two people for a while while a couple people wait. And the the downtime in Eternity RPG is like almost zero. Mm -hmm. Like you're if you're not playing your character, you're helping to contribute to the scene. So there's not a lot of just like sitting around time at all. Yeah, I can I can get that. And when it when it comes a lot of times when it comes to fantasy RPGs, especially the big one, and this is something I've railed I've railed on for. 20 years at this point oh, yeah. um, is the is is game is games that have a half in half out approach to whether or not they have a default setting and obviously the big sure. offender of this is D and D I've joked that D and D doesn't know whether sure. to shit or get off the pot when it comes to whether or not it has a default setting because it likes to it likes to claim that it can be used for any stuff for any kind of fantasy but the problem is that's a wide uh. net to cast that's a big net, <laughs> and that's that's kind of like say that's that's kind of like saying um, Conan and Tolkien are the same thing because they're both fantasy oh, stories. Right. And, sure. Well, if you tried to argue that, if you tried to argue that in certain circles, that's a good way to get your ass kicked. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, those at, are very different stories. Yeah, but at the same at at the at the same time. Um, it want it want it wants to have all these little 
notations and ideas of of some sort of um shared universe but it ne- sure. but it never na- it never nails down okay here's what the hard and fast rules are for D&D's setting and sure yeah they've sh- they've tried to pl- they've tried to have multiple ones that you could plug into but again it's it no- nothing ever really sticks mm-hmm. now when it comes to eternity especially with the especially with the um ch- the chapter all about se- all about setting up your ca- the campaign at the table and the multiple gm thing yeah um do you cons- do you consider eternity to be to be a game that's a bit more flexible in terms of its campaign setting attitude i do um the the main problem with the flexibility of a campaign setting for eternity is that the class system is so specific and unique mm-hmm. same with the races and so there is uh basically the the idea is that players will take what is provided um in the game and then customize that however they wish so because there are multiple gms and you're all sort of creating the world together it, it sort of requires that there's a lot of flexibility mm-hmm uh, but the game really, I would, I would say, really only works as a fantasy game, number one. And number two, I, I think that groups can take those fairly specific races and classes and sort of make them into what they want to be. But, like, for example, me and my gaming group right now are, are playing a fantasy world where we're choosing that magic is extremely rare. Mm-hmm. And so we're all only playing martial-type classes. Um and it still works, but you know when we come across like a cryomancer or something, you know it's like a really big deal. But you can, uh, yeah, you can sort of customize it, but it really fits within the parameters that are already given. Yeah, and something something that I did find a bit interesting when it came to the when it came to the way um, races are set up. Yeah, is the, is the fa- is the fact that a lot of times with a lot of times with races you might have a a couple mo- a couple modifiers and the and a racial effect or a raci- or a racial ability the lat- mm-hmm. the former being more the former being more common than the latter but in your case you have it that there are three um racial powers that can be picked from yeah um was that was that a was that just a response to the, to making it so that races actually matter in the game? Oh yeah, yeah. So I I have always wanted race to count for roughly half to a third of what your character is overall, mm-hmm. and I I just wanted race to feel substantial. Um, I think everybody's been in like gaming groups before where you're like sitting around a table and there's a ranger, but you have no idea what race he is because mm-hmm. maybe he doesn't role play that he has like low light vision or something. And you just like forget what people are. <laughs> and so I, I really wanted to make the game, you know, feel obvious that like, you know what race and class everybody is because they're, they're so unique. They're, there's, you know, distinguishing features that only they have, basically. Mm-hmm. And something, uh, something that I find interesting in the class design of the of the giving classes is is the um, is the mo- is the modific is the modifications for uh, for abilities when it co- when it comes to the um, critical options. Oh yeah, yeah. I appreciate you bringing that up. So, um, yeah, every class has ten spells or abilities, mm-hmm. which they're all unique. But I wanted that if two two people play the same class, if they're both playing a witch hunter, that you could play totally different versions of a witch hunter and still, you know, enjoy it a lot. Mm-hmm. And I think the replay value is really good there too. And so, yeah, every every class has three sort of 
uh, I guess you would say primary roles within that class. So a lot of people think of um, like healer or tank or like damage, right? Yeah, the but holy trinity. Right, right. But then there's I tried to add a lot more. So there's like debuffer, buffer, mover, um, additional options within combat, things like that. And so every class essentially has three of those. And then what a critical option is in Eternity is that instead of just like rolling a d20, rolling a 20, and then you crit, Mm -hmm. um, you actually use a resource point called Wisdom, which is essentially like your classes or your character's mana. Um, And by you can, so you can intentionally critical whenever you want by using one of these resource points. And that doubles the effect of whatever you're doing. Um, And it doubles it in a way that is like one of those roles. And so you, uh, you could choose if you're like a legionnaire, you could choose every one of your 10 abilities to have like the DPS critical option, Mm -hmm. or you can choose like DPS for a third of them and tank for a third of them and et cetera. So it gives you, um, I, I almost think of it like the original, like classic world of Warcraft talent tree where you, you had quite a bit of flexibility with where you would put your points and you Mm -hmm. could um, really do a lot of things with that. And that's kind of what I was going for with eternity. It's it's definitely something I can, I can see. Um, Sure. When it comes now, when it comes to, when it comes to advancement, when it comes to advancement, obviously there you have um, experience and you have fortune. Um, Yeah. What's what would be the what would be the primary differences between what would be the things that um, differentiate fortune from just standard experience when it comes to rewards? Yeah, so since there are the since there's no single GM, mm-hmm. there really had to be an effective way to make sure everybody was getting like a fair amount of EXP and uh, like money or treasures, and so the way the game works is that every time you get exp you also get an equivalent amount of fortune and fortune can be traded out anytime for uh either money which would be like based on your level you get a certain amount per fortune Mm -hmm. or you can roll for a random item and that's a great option if you're new to the game because you don't have to like look through the huge list of items that the book provides. You can just say, Hey, I don't really care what I get. Just as long as I get something good, mm-hmm. roll for it. Um, and if you roll for random items, you can also get more powerful treasures. So it sort of incentivizes new players to just like explore the game. Um, and yeah, that's, that's how that works. So you can, then the idea is that uh, whenever you spend fortune, you incorporate it into your role playing. So if you decide like, Hey, I, you know, we just want to fight. Um, I want to spend some fortune. You could say, Hey, behind, you know, a a locked door was like a treasure chest and a sword that you pick up. So Mm -hmm. it's really easy to incorporate in the overall story that way too. Oh yeah. Now when it comes Something that I did, something that I did notice, is that when it comes to the when it comes to the notion of skills, uh-huh. there um, you have you certainly have sk- you certainly have um, you have skills as as effectively subtypes of the core of the core at of the core attributes certainly, but sure you don't. But aside from aside from not aside from knowledge checks. You don't have the skill list that is often seen in a lot in a lot of fantasy games. Yeah, yeah, and that's just a stylistic choice. So what I always like to tell people is, you know, I think you should check out a lot of different types of role play games mm-hmm. because none of them is probably going to fit everything perfectly what you're looking for, um, and like Eternity is really in depth on the strategy and tactics of combat Mm -hmm. and in the group storytelling, but it's actually pretty light in the skills and knowledge checks. And the reason for that is that I, I wanted the game to have a lot of 
depth that people could get into. Um, but I also wanted a game that people could pick up and play in like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the idea with the skills and knowledge, I, I actually kind of based my idea for this around, um, I'm sure you've played Kingdoms of Amalur. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what I liked about the skills and knowledge in that game is that when you unlocked a new level of it, it was really simple. It just gave you the ability to do new things. It wasn't like a percent chance, really. It was just like, you can now do this. And it was it was probably the most simple application of like a skill system I'd seen in a game like that up to that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just enjoyed it massively. And so basically when you're playing a character in eternity, some people will love this. Some people won't. <laughs> and it's just the way it is. Um, <clears throat> you know, you can always do your own homebrew version of it if you want, but uh, you have like essentially a 50% chance to succeed in an averagely difficult scenario unless you have a bonus from your race or class or you're going to use an item in which case that goes up dramatically pretty quickly Mm -hmm. so it goes up like 25 percent right away and so the idea is that you it the idea is really to just go back to emphasize your your race or your class so that people remember like oh the stoneborn one of the races is really strong and he has a really high might check. Um, so it, it just reminds people really easily what race or class you're playing. So mm-hmm. that was kind of the purpose of that. Yeah. And when it comes to, when it comes to, when it comes to the, cl- when it comes to the classes, sure. I did, I did want to, I did want to kind of go over, Kind of um do a run kind of do a run rundown of the of them to yeah get it to get a feel for what sort of play style that the that each of them would cer- would certainly favor sure um and I'll st- I'll start from the top with assassin <laughs> yeah one of my favorites so you you want me to just kind of give you like an overview of the class and how it's yeah eff- effectively used in combat okay mm-hmm. cool um. So to explain Assassin, I I need to start by explaining just a couple basics of the game. Um, There's typically like a physical hit chance and a magic hit chance. Mm -hmm. And those are stats um, that are derived from your race and your class. So strike bonus would be for physical. Faith would be for magic. And Mm -hmm. Assassin doesn't really need to use either of them. They're really one of the only classes in the game that's like that because of their ability called assassinate where based on the enemy's health and the number of debuffs on them and a couple other um, things that you can do in combat, uh, you can just roll a D 20 and potentially kill them mm-hmm. and that's it. And it, it's, it's a big gamble type class, but um, it's unique in that way. All right. I- I can definitely get that. So it's it's one of those for people who um who are get, who are going to be the type who would pro- who would probably be the most likely to pr- to commit kill stealing. Oh yeah, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> like my youngest brother, he played an assassin and loved it. <laughs> he yeah. killed a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um it would def- it would definitely f- it would definitely fit the motif especially with the popularity of the Assassin's Creed games even though the most right. recent one of them um seems to have issues of what what the hell it's supposed to be, um, hmm. like ev- everything since Origins seems to seems to have no clue what it wants to be. Um, <laughs> it's a cool series, though. Cool, se- cool series. Um, it's kind of funny that they that they spent so much time tiptoeing around the idea of doing it, doing a game set in Japan that Sucker Punch decided, you know what, Sf- screw it. If they're not going to do it, we will. <laughs> and then we get Ghost of Tsushima, and the rest is history. <laughs> um, Everybody loves an assassin. Mm-hmm. Now, that br- that brings me to the next one, which is Berserker. And I can, and given given Berserkers and plenty of uh, Berserkers and Barbarians and plenty of other games, I yeah. can make some guesses. It's uh-huh. all it's all about rages. But where where do <laughs> rages or their equivalent differ in your take on Berserker? Yeah, I would say that. Um, 
and I, I guess just so everybody knows too, like if, if you haven't been able to tell already, you know, eternity really is a lot about the combat. So mm-hmm. the combat is very in depth. Um, and it's very chess like, and that's, I think why you're bringing it up because yeah. it's, it's a huge part of the game, but, um, yeah, berserker. I, I think my favorite ability that they have is, uh, the Omni strike ability mm-hmm. where you can just attack over and over and over again. And I just, I wanted to make the berserker class really fun. It's probably one of the more simple classes and probably one of the easier to play. Um, so if you're into melee classes and you know, you want to just hit stuff really hard, like this is probably the class for you. Mm -hmm. But, um, I love the berserker because they, they, they obviously are built on rage. They can dual wield. They can attack as much or more than probably any class and they can just do fun things like throw their weapons at people. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I, I don't know that it's, it's the most unique class I created, but it is, wildly fun yeah. and get, given how in some games um dual wielding requires weight requires a bit more work than it's worth i can sure. appre- i can appreciate it n- that not being the case here um sure yeah now the next which would probably be the class i'd end up using given some of the nicknames i've gotten over the years is cryomancer oh yeah you'd be a, why do you think you'd be a cryomancer um a few people have given me the unfortunate nickname of the Ice Dragon. Oh, Ice Dragon. That's kind of a cool nickname. <laughs> um, it, so, there's some, it's either some variation of that or, or Frost Giant because, well, I'm in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I can understand that. <laughs> so Cryomancer is really just a massive debuff class. Mm-hmm. So you can lower people's initiative, uh, which the initiative system in Eternity is is very unique. It's not static. Um, you actually re-roll every round, mm-hmm. sort of, um, and it adds up. Anyways, whole whole different topic probably. But yeah. they yeah they they're basically the perfect anti fighter. So a cryomancer versus a berserker, they are definitely classes that are you know better suited to face one another and. A berserker would have a really hard time even getting within range of a cryomancer. Yeah. Um. And when when I look at when I look at the effects for a cryomancer, I see that they they see that they have two forms in the two effects in the form of um, magic and double hit. Yeah. So double hit is actually uh, inherent to the game mm-hmm. on the whole. And that comes down to the dice system. So uh, it used to be. So so basically, Eternity is just a, a D20 versus D20. You only mm-hmm. use the D20 sided dice. Um, I did that just for simplicity, and I, I I liked only rolling one dice. I felt like it kept the pace of the game going faster, as mm-hmm. opposed to rolling multiple dice and adding them all up, doing math, etc. Um, but if you roll. 20 more than the opponent's defense you double hit um, which is you'll like cause another damage or you'll double the effect of the spell or whatever so um, it basically rewards you for having really high hit chance or punishes somebody for having really low defense so that the game also like some role play games really reward you for min maxing your Mm -hmm. character's stats and Eternity actually rewards you for, you can do that, or you can have a very balanced character and do just as well, because you won't get double hit as much. So. Mm-hmm. And next would be Druid, which um, Druid is one of those classes that often that I often find takes many takes many forms. Uh huh. Um, for sure. It's one of it's one of those potentially too broad kind of th- kind of things. Uh huh. Because you can have them that they either do, either do weather weather themed magic, um, mm-hmm. sh- um, beast fo- beast forms, or um, fo- or some or some fo- some sort of familiar, and yeah, that's oh, that's ultimately why the infamous Godzilla exists, i.e. cleric, or, yeah, cleric or <laughs> druid. Oh, I see, I see, yeah, yeah, because you can just do anything basically. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so all of those things, the shape shifting, the familiar, um, somewhat at least thematically, the control over nature is in the druid class. Mm-hmm. This one I really tried to kind of uh, mold after druid and classic World of Warcraft, where you can kind of do a lot of things. Um, you're probably not the best at it, and so yeah, druid they have the ability to heal. They can they have sort of a weak dispel. Um, shapeshift they can do a lot of different things but ultimately you kind of have to choose which direction you're going to go or you can do it all sort of averagely which is mm-hmm. you know fine too but yeah I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that they have in eternity having the ability to do more things doesn't mean that like you can do those things well all right that ma- that definitely makes sense um the next one fallen paladin um putting aside the, <laughs> one of my favorites putting aside the meme of the fall or die situation from that gm <laughs> i i can't i can't help but wonder with the fallen paladin was either the death knight or the dark knight uh-huh. from final fantasy in inspiration yeah dark knight <laughs> yeah like og final fantasy 4 or whatever mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so no matter what iteration of eternity I've made, the first class I always go back to is Fallen Paladin. I just I just really like that class. Um, and so they have the ability to heal themselves or others by causing damage. Um, they have a couple buffs, and they can hurt other people if they aren't healed in a certain time frame. Then they've got status effects like fears and stuns and... Mm-hmm. Um, they can tank by making you have a lower hit chance against everyone else. So you don't have to attack them, but you just do worse. So it's, it's kind of a fun class. I, I always enjoy playing it. It's still my main character. Um, I just love the theme of it. And so I, I really tried to make all of their abilities dark and menacing mm-hmm. and sort of badass. Um, Dread March is my favorite ability of theirs, where when you drop to zero hit points, you just get filled with shadow energy, and you can more or less come back to life for a, you know, with a small amount of HP. I just mm-hmm. I love that kind of thing. Yeah, I can I can definitely yes I can definitely see that ki- that kind of thing playing out. Um, now, when it comes to je- when it comes to um Jester, <laughs> that one Jester. that one there is. <laughs> Um, while there's, while there's been a few games that have had a Harlequin class, um, usually uh-huh. they end up getting blended into some variant of Rogue, but sure. a, but when it comes to the, when it comes to this class, the, would it be accurate of me to say that the main inspiration was Blue Mages? Yeah, that in the Mime class in Final Fantasy Tactics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Um, Jester was also me, like I, there isn't really an official way to multi-class in Eternity. Mm-hmm. You can, you can do it, um, but it's not in the rules. Like I, I think probably that it would not be broken, but <laughs> the Jester is actually sort of the multi-class class to where you can use other abilities that other classes use during combat by mimicking them and as you level up you can choose abilities from any class uh within like your level range and so what you end up is kind of like jester is probably the hardest class to play I, I wouldn't recommend anybody do it until they've played at least a few other classes because you can either end up with like a probably very powerful character depending on your choices and the way that you fight in combat, or you can end up just being uh, pretty weak. So I've experimented with the Jester a little bit, and I love playing it. (laughs) But I think that you have to really be somebody who can really get into the ins and outs of the game to play it well. Mm -hmm. Now, with the next one, when I I see it, I immediately think of um, Tactics Advance and um, Final Fantasy XII, 
and that is uh -huh. the judge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's from 12. That that was the inspiration for Judge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, judge has, every time I look through Judge, I kind of like mm -hmm. chuckle a little bit because they just have all kinds of very unique abilities. Um, they effectively have like a World of Warcraft, Death Knight, Death Grip ability where you can just pull somebody right next to you. Mm -hmm. um, they have the ability to taunt enemies uh, they can keep allies fighting even when you like drop to zero HP, um, hit multiple targets at a time. Like they, they just um, a very very versatile class. And classes in Eternity are either like martial based, physical, mm -hmm. or magical, or a combination. And the combination classes um, you really can play them either as a mage or physical. And Judge is one of those classes. Yeah, I can. T would it be fair to would it be fair to say that they'd have? Some, actually, I was gonna I was gonna ask if they had if they had some similarities <laughs> to say a warlord, but I'd say the next sure. one fits the bill better on that, and yeah. that's the legionnaire. Yeah, the le the legionnaire is sort of the quintessential warlord. So, um, in in my current campaign, that's what I'm paying, playing, and it's really a class that's meant to buff the rest of your party mm -hmm. um, and you get abilities that buff them passively based on like if how that your formation sort of is laid out and what your allies are doing like if you're attacking the same target or if you're standing next to each other stuff like that mm -hmm. um, but they also have a combination that I just find really fun which is break morale uh, where you can choose a target in range to effectively effectively reduce their defenses to zero and then you can hit them with like an uh damage over time ability mm -hmm. that um you know you can use on your very next turn and yep. i love that combination so <laughs> it's uh it's become one of my favorite classes even though it's really it's not the most thematically unique class i think that the abilities are pretty cool yeah um now, next one is the next one is well, it's fit. It's fitting within my gimmick, and that is the monk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All about that monk. Mm -hmm. um, so the monk. <laughs> really, with each class, I just tried to like do something that I thought would be so much fun to mm -hmm. do, and so you get really large uh, stat bonuses for not using armor or weapons as a monk. You know, fits mm -hmm. the theme, and you have all kinds of buffs you can apply to yourself to, you know, we talked about wisdom being like a, a mana point for criticals. Mm -hmm. um, so you can steal that from enemies. You can, you can damage their wisdom. Um, you can almost like final fantasy tactics, like the old Hamido ability. If somebody attacks you, you can attack them first. Um, and then they have one version of the monk. If you, if you want to play this style, is the inner fire style. And basically it's just a lot of stacks that you get from using various monk abilities. And when you stack it high enough, you can do an instant attack that does um, like enough damage to one shot somebody. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it, man, the monk, the monk has all kinds of really unique things. They can become immune to physical damage, magic damage for short times. It's, it's fun for sure. And it, it's certainly it's certainly a step up from flurry of blows all day every day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It you gotta since you don't have uh, armor, especially as a monk, you really gotta make use of your abilities, um, probably all of them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Now, the Nether Knight. Um, I've I've got a. When I look at that one, I could I could uh -huh. see some comparisons with the Mystic Knight in some in some versions of Final Fantasy. But sure. What? But um. But then there's the fact that it's th that its starting ability, um, focuses on illusions, and I'm cu I'm curious yeah. what you were building on when it came to the Nether Knight. <laughs> so, have uh, you ever played the Phantom Lancer in Dota? No, I um. Okay. I I didn't play a lot of the original. I didn't play a lot of the original Dota because it was. 
because it was a while until I fi I finally was able to access Warcraft mods. Sure, sure. Um, the Phantom Lancer, the whole idea behind that hero in that game was that you would either like create illusions of yourself um, that you know, or you could like throw your spear and it would do damage and create an illusion of yourself. So the idea is that by attacking, by using your abilities, you were creating illusions that over time um, could then actually even create illusions of themselves. And so there's a really, there's a couple ways to play the nether Knight. You can play it as like a really high magic hit chance character that is just aimed at doing damage. And then you can, consume your illusions for additional faith mm -hmm. or you can basically just build up like a fucking army and it can take a while to build that up but um once you get probably past like five illusions on the field they start creating illusions of themselves and then it it really just snowballs out of control yeah so yeah mm -hmm. now when it comes to the oracle obviously the first thing that comes to mind is the um Oracle from from Final Fantasy Tactics, which was kind sure. of kind of the kind of Final Fantasy spin on a on the idea of an onmyunji. I'm not familiar with that term. Um, onmyunji, it they were basically a type. They're basically a type of diviner that was util that was utilized in feudal Japan. Um, okay. A lot of it is a lot of it was was um, based on imports of Taoism. Okay, and sure. That's a va that's a vast um, simplification of the matter, but they te they tend to, they uh, tend to do operate uh, operate thematically around the concept of balance between light and dark. Yeah, yeah, and um, that's a a pretty fundamental way to I guess explain the Oracle and Eternity. Mm -hmm. um, I really wanted to make a class that made you feel when you're role playing it like you can tell the future mm -hmm. um and give you abilities that sort of <laughs> like help give stats and battle abilities that match that so for example their first two abilities are premonition and omen and those abilities are almost like you're giving a premonition to an ally that you're going to be attacked so you gain additional defense against the next attack made against you or omen, you know, additional hit chance. Um, and then they have, uh, similarly divine spark, um, the ability to resist shadow damage, holy damage. And they just have really fun abilities like doom. Mm -hmm. So doom is almost like a ranged assassinate that, y you know, the, the enemy doesn't, necessarily get to make a roll against you you just you know roll the d20 and then you have to wait a certain number of turns and if it hits they die like it's um there's lots of counters to that kind of thing in the game but mm -hmm. it is uh it's a very scary <laughs> thing when you get doomed so yeah and when now when it comes to the paladin and this is the reason yeah. why this is the other reason why I bring up that GM because we've all seen the case of uh -huh. the GM who puts people in the <laughs> fall or die situation which pro tip uh, everyone don't yeah. do that. Yeah, don't do that. It's mean. Yeah. So so Paladin I I really enjoyed playing uh Retribution Paladin in mm -hmm. World of Warcraft Classic. So obviously mm -hmm. World of Warcraft another one of the big inspirations for my game. Mm -hmm. And Paladins they're, um, they have the ability to heal. They have the ability to take damage in place of others. Um, they have the ability to... Basically, they're, they're really all about building up stacks of Divine Defender, which is like a, it's like a secondary resource that they have mm -hmm. um, that you can build up by using really a number of abilities. And so the Paladin just gets stronger and stronger as the fight goes on. Um, so they, they can start off relatively unintimidating, actually. And so by the end of, the, of a fight, though, they can be very strong. All right. Now, when it comes to Summoner, I don't, I don't even have to guess where the, where the uh, idea for that is coming from. 
Um, or, actually, actually, I just realized I just realized I skipped a few because the next is um is Pyromancer. Oh, Pyromancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Pyromancer basically the the anti Cryomancer. Mm-hmm. Um, they it it's kind of like Berserker. It, it's like the magic form of just the highest damage. Everything just all at once. Uh, magic class. So. Um, AOE, Abyssal Flare is their main spell. It just does a ton of damage, really high hit chance. So, yeah, yeah pretty simple class, but fun. Mm-hmm. And I also like that. I also like the whole summer and winter theme that you ha- that you have set up with them. It, yeah, in a weird way, it kind of reminds me of the um, Umbral Ice Astral Fire thing that the Black Mage has in fi- in Final Fantasy fourteen. Okay, I I actually haven't played that game, so I'm not super familiar. Um, the I, the idea with the idea with it is that it is when you, if you're playing a black mage, um, umbral ice and as, and astral, the umbral and astral stances are to are um are uh, going to be your main um are going to be your main part of cycling, mm-hmm. because, um, in you're in you're in ast- you're in the astral stance when you cast f- when you cast a fire spell in the umbral stance when you cast an ice spell. Gotcha. Umbral doesn't do as much damage, but it aids in your MP regeneration. Okay. Whereas astral does a lot more damage, but you're eat but you're eating up your MP. So the idea is, you is go astral when you're at hi- when you're at high HP and go umbral when you're at low eight. A- not HP MP. Um, MP. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And just and just and cycle back and forth. And obviously, when you get to higher levels, there's other things that mix things up. That mix things up. But it's yeah. in it, it's an yeah. interesting approach. It is interesting. I I enjoy that kind of um, style of play for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Um. And that that brings so the the next one on the list is is listed as revenant or witch. Yeah, when so I it's like s- male, female is the idea. Like how, like how in certain in certain FF games you have um, bard and dancer being the same class, just one is just each is not gender specific. Yeah, and there's you know that. that <laughs> I just want to clarify. I feel like you have to in today's world. Like there's there's nothing political in that. It's just like I wanted to have a revenant, but I also thought witch was appropriate for the, the class. So mm-hmm. you can call it whatever you want, but yeah. revenant witch. Um, so in Eternity, there, there's three classes that have light auras, and that would be, um, we talked about one of them so far, Paladin, mm-hmm. and then there's Sage and Witch Hunter coming up. Yeah. And then the sort of the anti, opposite of that, would be the Shadow Aura classes, which is Fallen Paladin, um, Revenant, and then Vampire Mage. And so mm-hmm. Paladin and Fallen Paladin are sort of opposites. Um, the Witch and the Witch Hunter... <laughs> Are sort of opposites, mm-hmm. and then the vampire mage and the sage, and so, like the revenant, I like to they their most iconic ability or spell is spellbound, mm-hmm. which gives you an ever increasing chance throughout the fight to take control of your target's actions, um, which is incredibly fun, and really they are kind of a light mobile uh, melee or mage class that can do damage. Um, but they're really kind of excel as like a debuff type class. All right. Now with Royal Gu- with Royal Guard, um, yeah, I could see I could see some people making comparisons to some of the to some of the other martial classes that you ha- that you have, especially sure. especially um, since given 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 the um, motif that it go that it goes with. And so, and the way it's the way it kind of evokes, I could see some people um, comparing it to the judge. But where does it sure. differ from that? Yeah, so the royal guard is really a shield bearing class, um, and the i the idea is that it's like the quintessential tank. Mm-hmm. And so, um, rather than doing like a lot of damage, they're all almost all of their abilities are aimed around uh, dazing or really stunning enemies um because you are preventing them from hurting your allies at that point and Mm -hmm. then 
really all of their attacks are enhanced when, against a dazed target. So the idea is to like get a big shield, get in the middle of everybody, use some of your abilities to get them to attack you, daze them, and then start fighting. All right. Now, when it comes to the sage, I've seen this. I've seen sages in in other instances, and a lot of times they're used as yeah. the class who can do both black and white magic, but also do sure. high magic. Um, sure. What What was the approach that you had with sage? Yeah. So, um, sage sage was one of the more difficult classes, to be honest. Um, so, I really tried to take the oracle as like this what other class other games make a sage to be mm -hmm. and then this the sage in eternity is almost more like a priest um however i, I didn't want to make it that like straight up holy so they have uh basically abilities that can also debuff enemies uh battlefield control mm -hmm. yin yang magic makes it so that when allies get hurt so does their attacker potentially um but then they do have the game's strongest heals and buffs. So, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to samurai, I'll get the obvious out of <laughs> out of my out of my system. Yeah, yeah. Please. Am I gonna? Would somebody <laughs> playing samurai have to wor have to worry about their sword breaking? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Yeah, samurai. Um, I samurai is one of my favorite classes. It's um, kind of like berserker in the sense that it just hits really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but it it's a lot more complex because you can change your fighting stance in the middle of combat, and so you can give yourself different stat boosts depending on what you feel you need. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have a variety of sword techniques. So I named all the sword techniques after like famous swords like Masamune and um, Murumasa. Mm -hmm. And they basically just give you advantages based on what's happening in the fight. So if you like a class that has, you know, if you're into like sword technique and stuff like that, then I mean, Samurai is the way to go. Super right. fun. And when, now, since I had mentioned it before, the, the next obviously would be Summoner, which... Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Self-explanatory yeah, where that's summoner. coming from. Yeah, yeah, summoner. Um, so there, there's two types of summons I've always liked in games. There's the summon where you actually like bring a familiar next to you, and it's mm -hmm. just super strong and badass and does all the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. um, then there's also like some of the Final Fantasy type games where you summon, and it's like an it's like a spell that hits everybody. Yeah, and so the summoner has both. You can play it. Uh, really either way to do mm -hmm. a lot of magic damage to do healing or to have a, a very strong ally yeah and of course and of course of course like i can pretty much sum that up as a pre-10 summoner or a 10 or a post-10 summoner yeah yeah <laughs> um now when it comes to the thief and i can hear i can hear <laughs> i can hear someone in the distance sh screaming out treasure hunter <laughs> sure um obvious obviously the, obviously they are they're going to be focusing on st on stealing stuff. Yeah, of course. But of course. How do you how do you manage <laughs> to make that work in in set in setups where you're dealing with monsters that don't that may not have something to well steal? Yeah, so basically um I I would say that so all, all the classes are really designed around um, like player versus player balance. Mm -hmm. And so like, for example, once per year um, I host a two V two tournament for eternity. So I'll, I'll probably let you know. And you know, if you want to play or, you know, let your, your audience know if mm -hmm. they want to participate, I, you know, I usually give away like a 50 or a hundred dollar gift prize to whoever wins. <laughs> um, and it's just like, it's just fun, you know, like I, I'm happy to spend the money on that, but mm -hmm. So, so yes, um, I would say if you are role playing and you're fighting like a dragon, you should not be able to steal their weapon, quote unquote, and debuff them. Um, it depends, you know. Uh, so yeah, pro probably if you're fighting monsters and you're being strict about it, thieves 
can't use quite as many of their debuffs, but they really are a debuff class. Um, they excel at using poisons, kind of the more like uh, things that you would expect from a fantasy class thief are, are mm-hmm. all pretty much there. And then I would say my two favorite things is the unassuming ability. So, um, so long as you're not being aggressive to somebody, they can't target you if you have an ally around who they can target first. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I really like their gamble ability <laughs> where you basically roll a D20 and you pick a stat and it will either go up or down based on your gamble. So All yeah, right. it's a cool ability. And now when it comes to vampire mage, this, I, this I found kind of interesting because sure. there's, there's often, I remember, um, in some games, there's a bit of a debate about whether or not a, whether or not vampire should count, should count as a race or as a class. Yeah. Yeah. And, people um venture back and forth on what on which it should count towards especially sure. especially when heroes of shadow came out for um D fourth edition and made vampires a um class instead of a race yeah it's interesting yeah um so vampire mage is really both mm-hmm. uh because you can actually the bloodline ability in the vampire mage allows you to permanently become a vampire um, and if you do that, then you can gain some of those spells as like normal actions. They, they don't actually really count as spells anymore, like mm-hmm. um, Blood Drain. Um, so Vampire Mage is, is really a healing class. You drain life from others, give it to your allies. Uh, but they also have the ability to damage themselves in order to harm ally, or harm enemies or to heal allies. And by doing so, you gain stacks of blood healing, like another secondary resource, mm-hmm. which can increase your chance to drain life. So it's like this big um, resource game that you're playing because you're always damaging yourself. It's like a high-risk type class. Um, and then you can also summon undead as a mm-hmm. vampire mage. So it's almost like a necromancer in a way, too. Which def- definitely makes definitely makes sense. Um, I c- um, just if I have, if I ever run if I ever run eternity at my table, I'm ma- I'm putting an unwritten rule that nobody ma- nobody asks the question, "What is a man?" T- if anybody's playing vampire mage, <laughs> nobody asks the question, "What is a man?" Is that what you said? Yeah. What is that from? Um, Symphony of the Night. Uh, okay. <laughs> yep. Um. <laughs> Now, when it comes to Vanguard, would it be accurate to say that Vanguard is your spin on the Hunter? It is, yeah, I, or like the Archer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the idea with the Vanguard, I've seen people play it with like sh- like really melee range weapons, mm-hmm. and it can work, uh, but I think it works best with like a spear and a longbow, and one of the great abilities that's so simple with Vanguard is quick switch. So once per turn, you can switch your weapons so you can, um, use some of your really advanced mobility to get out of range, shoot somebody. Uh, and then if they get up close again, you can like switch to a sword and shield if you want. Mm-hmm. Um, and Vanguard has the ability to counter attack. They can have, very high hit chance at the expense of lowering their own defense for a turn and vice versa. Um, Vanguard of, of every fighter class, they have the most options I would say of what you can do, Mm -hmm. so to speak. And the last is witch hunter, which I will admit because of my, because of my own background, when I see witch hunter, the, um, Main th- the main thing that comes to mind is the witch hunter in Warhammer, which is basically a sure. giant XP of um, <laughs> Solomon Kane. Sure. <laughs> but what approach were you trying to go with with the witch hunter and um, what was your um it, what was your um thematic inspiration for it? You know, wit- witch hunter was one of those ones that I I think was loosely based on other games at one point, and is really just over the years taken on its completely own life. Mm-hmm. So it's it's almost like part paladin, part anti-mage. So they have the ability to continually increase their own physical hit chance or initiative. Um, and that pairs really well with like their consecrate ability, which is like an AOE around them 
mm-hmm. chance to heal allies and damage enemies. Um, they also have Crystal Aegis, which is a damage immunity and debuff immunity. Um, they have quick tumble, which you just completely avoid an attack aimed at you. They have they have all kinds of like really high mobility, high survivability type stuff. But then, really, almost all of their other abilities just aim at totally messing up spellcasters. So, reducing their hit chance, silencing them, um, generally just making life really hard. Mm-hmm. And give now earlier you. You kind of hinted at it, but you mentioned that initiative isn't a static affair. It's not a case where everybody rolls initiative and that's the initi- that's the turn order for the remainder of the encounter. Yeah. Um, so we are we we currently have a Google script, um, and I'm actually I just had a web designer create code to put on our website, so people mm-hmm. will actually be able to go on the website and use this role tracker during games, like even from your iPhone or your Google, I mean, any, any smartphone. And basically what it is, is that, uh, it, it, and you don't have to use this by the way, you can just use two D 20. It's effectively the same thing, but Mm -hmm. basically it's a D 40 roller. It adds your initiative. And then every time you reach a multiple of 50, so 50, 100, 150, et cetera, um, you, you get to go. Um, so if you use like the our website for that which that that should be up probably in a week or so um it'll actually like highlight your character when it's your turn to go Mm -hmm. and so what ends up happening with this is that sometimes you end up going twice before somebody else goes once um or sometimes they'll go first sometimes you'll go first so it it just creates a, a much more dynamic um combat situation it's you can't predict it's not like chess. Like you don't know that it's going to be your turn, then their turn. Mm-hmm. Um, it just makes it a bit more. I, I I think dynamic is the word. Which I can um, I can certainly I can certainly see that ap- that approach. It's it's one that I think the only time I've seen that that attempt at a di- at a dynamic turn system is mm-hmm. two is in two games I've played recently. Um, really? One of them was Unchained Heroes, which had th- which had this tick which had this ticking up um, initiative system where you where um, the action that much like the way um, World of Darkness has the whole ticks thing, uh-huh. the di- the difference is that Unchained Heroes had it where that would constantly go up. Okay. Um, so in, like say you'd roll initiative at the start, and that would be the initiative for the first turn. Then everybody does their actions for that turn, and based on the actions, they add to they um add to their total. With sure. sl- slow actions, a- every action is going to add to the initiative. It's just fast actions are going to add more to it, and slow actions are going to add less. Sure. Um. Yeah. And th- yeah, and that's how that's the that's the that approach. Um. And the other was Anima, where, um, in where um, init- where you're where given the fact that certain characters are going to have multiple weapons. In fact, there's an entire class based on having multiple weapons at once. Uh-huh. Um, you could potentially have three diff- um, three or four different um, levels of initiative that could that could switch because you're constantly switching weapons between rounds. Sure. Since yeah, yeah, that makes since sense. At the, start, at the start of the order, everyone re-rolls initiative again. Sure, it's almost like swing speed or something like that. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, I I really like any system that that attempts to go a little bit further with initiative. Mm-hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with like just static D and D initiative because it's simple. Um, I think our really my goal with this initiative system was to still keep it as simple as possible, but just add another layer um, of depth to the combat system. It's, that, um, that definitely makes, that definitely makes sense. Now, I know you, I know you mentioned the, the code thing, but what else do you, what else do you have planned for the future of eternity? Yeah. So there are, um, really five or six expansions that I want to do. And some of them will be 
you know, similar stuff to what you see in other games. So I have a couple more races planned, a couple more classes. Uh, I'd like to expand on the items. I'd like to create a really we have a whole world of lore already created i'm just Mm -hmm. trying to figure out the right way to format it and how to still make it very accessible to people making their own worlds so that'll be one of them uh there's going to be an expansion for higher levels Mm -hmm. because right now eternity really maxes out at level 10 i mean it'll take you you know six months to a year to get to level 10 um but I'd like to really open that up to like unlimited levels, but, but still keep balance. And then the last one is actually, it, it's almost a separate game type and it used to be on the website, but I am, it's still kind of in the play testing phase. So when it was on the website before I sold it for free, <laughs> you could just go on there you could download mm-hmm. it and it's called the Lord's system. And I've run a number of games with this and people love it, but it, it just needs some tweaking. And the idea is that instead of just role playing a character, you're actually role playing the Lord of a kingdom. And it's almost like a kingdom builder expansion mm-hmm. uh, that I would like to really um, merge in with the main game as well. And right now they, they don't. So it's almost two different games. So, yeah. And, the, and I'll d- I'll definitely be keeping an eye on how on how that particular thing develops because obviously sure. um obviously people people like the idea of be of being bigger players than just a, than just a jumped up adventurer at hi- at higher yeah. levels um, yeah there are some there are some games like Axe that are specifically designed around that ki- that kind of thing sure and while while old school D and D obviously had the whole thing of for certain cla- for certain classes like the fighter at higher levels you become a lord and start to get followers. Um, sure. It was one of the it was one of those things that was never that was never quite um, given the proper amount of cooking that it needed, for lack mm-hmm. of a better term. Yeah. Yeah, um, and that that's the very thing. So the the Lord system we've been playing for probably like six or seven years at this point and it's still <laughs> is in that cooking phase mm-hmm. but the the essential mechanics of how it works um is that you have a, a number of resources and you have a number of you know call it follow followers army size you know buildings etc and really the way the game's played is by note cards so you need like five or six people Mm-hmm. and somebody will write somebody a note card and put it face down. And it's not like turns. This is all just happening in real time. And then somebody will notice that that, you know, exchange take place. And so then they'll create an alliance with somebody else. And it's, it's really like the game emerges sort of from the shadows. Like mm-hmm. this whole game is being played, but it's all like subterfuge and, you know, um, and then so, all of a sudden somebody will just die, you know, <laughs> like an hour Oh, an hour later, after people just furiously scribbling my note cards. <laughs> oh, someone got the Roman handshake. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, I I think some of my favorite gaming experiences have been with that. I just I haven't quite. <laughs> that's why I'm really dedicated to getting that one out there for sure. Because I think it's I think it's unique. Yeah, I'm curious if you've con- if you've considered implementing some sort of mass combat in with that particular system. Yes, yes. Um, that's another thing that I'm still trying to work on I, the idea is that you could play a lot of different classes like mm-hmm. in in units of 10 or 20 100 whatever um and so in the first versions of lords you know each class only had like one ability yeah. or two just for simplicity mm-hmm. and i can i can see that given the given the fact that it was a test but obviously that's something that'll probably um ex- probably expand with time i think so yeah um yeah i would love love to get that out there and maybe maybe i can get you to play test it one time and you know i'd love to hear your thoughts so uh, <laughs> i'd um i'm cer- i'm certainly no stranger to to, to taking in progress ideas and rip and ripping them apart so hey man i i love that i'm all mm-hmm. about it yeah so that's that's certainly that's certainly something that could be done 
But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This mm-hmm. was great. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as I often say around awesome, here, man. drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Well, yeah, this has been great, man. Anytime that I can, we can reconnect, mm-hmm. I would love to. Yeah. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>